Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Her Faith Inspires podcast, where we take cultural issues and align them to biblical truth. I have a great episode for you today that I know is going to encourage you, equip you, and motivate you to stand firm on the truth of God's word. Before we get into it, I want to remind you of the amazing online courses from onlinechristiancourses.school. That is where I received four of my certificates and have learned from Dr. Frank Turk, J. Warner Wallace, and Scott Klusendorf. My apologetics knowledge has grown exponentially from just learning through OCC, and now I have the privilege of working alongside them as they educate and equip other Christians to defend the faith. If you use my code SHANDA10, that's SHANDA10, you get 10% off of any of the the courses. They also have self-paced courses that are, if you go look, you'll see a slew of different topics that you can learn how to talk about homosexuality, how to talk about progressive Christianity with Elisa Childers, or you can take premium courses, which I know the abortion course is getting ready to come up and be taught by Scott Klusendorf. I just finished that one in January. So again, go to onlinechristiancourses.school for more information and to get your 10% discount. And we have a huge announcement to make. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is the best-selling book by Dr. Frank Turk and Norman Geisler. It's the book I had to learn and really study a lot before I went to the CIA, which is the Cross-Examine Instructors Academy last summer. But Frank is going to be teaching adults this summer a premium course where you do live Zooms with him for um, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And alongside that course, I will be teaching fourth through sixth graders at their level all of the concepts from I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. They'll get live Zooms, 12 lessons, all tailored after this best-selling book by uh, Dr. Turek and Norman Geisler. And it helps children to learn what they believe and why they believe it in this culture that they're growing up in. So this can be a premium course. It's also going to be offered as a self-paced course. And it's also going to be in a homeschool type of curriculum or just a curriculum you may want to do with your kids at home, uh, even if they're in public school or private school. And we have it offered for second graders through the fourth grade as well. You can go to impactapologetics.com and take a look at that. I know that's a lot. All of this will be written in the show notes. The show notes are always posted on my website. You can check them out there at shandafulbright.com. Okay, so have you ever heard anyone say, we don't really need to read our Bibles or that God doesn't want Bible reading to become a routine. He doesn't want it to become legalistic. All you really need to do is like worship God while you drive your car or Bible reading doesn't have to be this legalistic thing. So we're going to talk about that. You know, a lot of people get worried that Bible reading can become works-based and God doesn't want us checking boxes. And many a Christian has taken this advice to heart and stopped reading their Bibles or haven't made it that priority in life or haven't even made it routine and a spiritual discipline. So, uh, you know, they'll tell you to put it back on the shelf until you feel like reading it again, or until you get this, you know, stirring in you to be passionate about Bible reading. That's what we're going to talk about today. Should we take that advice to heart? Or how do we put that in its proper perspective? If you've listened to me long enough, you know what I think of the Bible. I've mentioned this stat more times on this podcast than last year than I think I have in my entire lifetime, even though the percentage has definitely changed over my lifetime. But it's worth mentioning because it brings a reality to the situation of the church, or at least to those who call themselves Christians, but place a very low value on God's word. With that said, the statistic is that 65% of Americans claim to be Christian. They claim to know God, yet only 6% of those people have a biblical worldview. That means that only 6% actually hold to the Bible and the fundamentals of Christianity. One of the criteria for having a biblical worldview, and there are several criteria, but one of the criteria is believing the Bible is inerrant, that it's the infallible word of God, and that it was inspired by God. Alicia Ilian discussed the reliability of the Bible in episode 123, so listen to that if you haven't yet, but we didn't really get into the inerrancy of the Bible, and I can do that in another podcast episode for those of you who would like that, like what makes it inerrant, why do we believe there's no errors in the Bible, or that it's infallible, let me know if you do. You can email me at hello at shandafulbright.com. But really quick, I can tell you that the only errors 
if you want to call them errors, that's, you know, quotation marks errors in the Bible are spelling errors and grammatical errors, but no errors that actually change the meaning or the context of the Bible itself. Okay, again, we can get deeper into that, but that is something you learn in apologetics, by the way. So what I want to do today is talk to you about why you must read the Bible every day. Okay, I disagree with the whole, the Bible shouldn't be something you do to check off a list. I understand the point. Okay, don't get me wrong. I understand that it's not just, okay, I read my Bible today and toss it to the side. But there are plenty of days that I don't necessarily want to read or study the Bible. Okay, I don't always, quote unquote, feel like it. And those of you who know the way I feel about feelings, okay, you're not going to feel like reading the Bible most days. It is a spiritual discipline. Discipline is something that you don't feel like doing. I don't feel like going to work out in the mornings when I wake up. I want to stay in my nice, warm, cozy bed. But I have a physical discipline of getting up and going to work out, even when I don't feel like it. Spiritual discipline is the same. So I do understand the point, but you're not going to feel like it. You're not always going to want to read the Bible. You're going to want to know God. I want to know who God is. So I read the Bible, even if I don't feel like it. Okay. It is so much easier to grab a Bible study book and let someone else do the heavy lifting, you know, or let the audio roll on my Bible app and have it read to me. Those things are easy. And by the way, I listen to my Bible app in the morning when I'm putting on my makeup and doing my hair. So I'm not giving it my full attention. I think my full attention would be like, don't do anything else while I just sit there and take it all in. But that's what I do when I listen. My study time's separate and my study time looks a lot different. But here's my own personal my own personal standard. If I make sure I eat food every day, I will make sure that I read and study the Bible every day. It is part of my musts. It is my non-negotiables. Okay. And yes, my non-negotiable is to eat unless I fast, you know, and pray, which I'll be honest, I haven't fasted in over a year. But That would be the only time I'm going to go without food or if I get, sometimes I get super busy in the afternoons, I forget to eat lunch, but it's rare. Okay. And when it gets down to becoming a routine, I pray and ask God to help me love his word. When I know that, man, God, I don't really feel like reading. Help me to feel like it. Help me to do it and develop that love for it anyway. I'm honest with God. He knows when I don't feel like it. So I might as well tell him the struggle and ask for his help with it. Because at the core, I do want to know God. I do want to read the word to know him. I just don't feel like it. So I'm going to push past what I don't feel like. Okay. That's the reason I won't go a day without it. If I'm going to get up and do the discipline of working out, if I'm going to get up and do the discipline of what's not even really a discipline of eating, but if I'm going to make sure that I eat for the feed my physical body, I'm going to make sure that I eat to feed my spiritual body. Now, with that said, again, I admit it is sometimes hard to study the Bible because I don't always feel like it, but I will tell you, why I do it anyway. I have created a discipline of reading and studying God's word in my life after years of going to church and being nonchalant about reading the Bible. I didn't really understand why it was a non-negotiable or why it should be growing up. I knew it was important. I knew that I believed in the Bible and who God was, but I didn't establish a discipline until honestly, I was 30. 30 years old, my second child was born and I went through a very dark time of anxiety and depression, and I really knew then that I needed to renew my mind and, and really know who God was. And, you know, and so I haven't gone a day without reading the Bible since I was 30. So here is why I say, yes, you should read the Bible, even if it becomes a routine. In fact, it better be a routine because that is what God wants it to be. So first, when you think of the word of God, when you think of the Bible, what physical thing does the Bible equate God's word to? Okay, because we we see figurative language used in the Bible. I've talked about this before. Where do you take God's word literally? Where it's meant to be taken literally. When God uses figurative language, there's a lesson to be learned in there. And a lot of times God uses figurative language and one of those is a simile. Okay, so with a simile, God equates the word of God. He's comparing two like things with the words like and as. He equates the word of God to something that we can understand from the world. 
Okay. So here is a few things that I'm sure the Bible mentions more of these things, but here are a few things. And we actually talked about this in our theology class at church on Sunday mornings, which I absolutely love the theology class in church. It's my favorite class. It's my favorite thing to do on Sunday mornings is to go learn about theology. But here are a few things that we even discussed. The word of God is equated to the word of God is like a seed You can find that in Luke 8 with the parable of the sower. The word of God is like a lamp. You can find that in Psalms 119, 105. The word of God is like a mirror. You can find that in James 123. The word of God is like a sword, Ephesians 6, 17. The word of God is like bread, John 6, 35. The word of God is like a foundation in Matthew 7, 24 through 27 with the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. So I want to break these down in short snippets because I think we can literally take an entire episode for each one. But what I hope you see is how important it is for us to value time spent in the word. And not only do we have to value the time spent in the word, we must handle it with care. Okay. Scripture taken out of context and misinterpreted is just as dangerous as listening to a false teacher twisting the word. Okay. True. We'll talk more about it in a bit. So for now, let's look at each of these similes one by one. So, you know, again, all of these things are simile using it using like or as and comparing two like things. So what the word is like from things we know and see in the world. We know what a seed is. We know what a mirror is. We know what a lamp is. Okay, we, we understand those things well because we live with them every day. The word of God is like those things. The Bible often uses figurative language so that we can make these comparisons and understand the word better. Language is sometimes richer when we use figurative language because it brings a depth of understanding that speaking literally often does not. For example, if I said, you should love God's word, you can understand that, right? You should love God's word. But how about when I say the word of God is like a seed that takes root in your heart and produces fruit? Which one brings more depth? The simile, right? That is why Jesus often spoke in parables. It kept truth seekers seeking and it kept truth deniers blind. Because if you want to know the truth, you have to reach for it. You have to dig in a little bit. You have to desire it. Okay. So the first simile, the words like a seed. One of my favorite lessons that haunts me, I guess you could say, is the one Jesus taught with the parable of the sower. He talked about the seed falling on different types of soil of the heart and equated that soil to the hearts of of men. If you've ever done gardening, and honestly, I haven't done much at all, then you know there are different types of soil. I've tried to shovel hard pan dirt before, believe it or not. Not sure what I was doing shoveling hard pan, but it's happened at least once in my life. And I can tell you right now, it is not easy. Sometimes you just hit plain old rock. It's just hard. You have to work the ground, you have to water it, you have to get the rocks out, or you just can't plant anything. The soil is not ready. It's not good for producing. And then there's the sandy soil that's not good for planting either because it just sand soaks in all the water and it doesn't give any nourishment to the trees. So we used to have almond trees in California and we planted them in sandy soil. And no matter what we did, the trees didn't grow. They didn't grow evenly and the soil wasn't good and we didn't take the time or spend the money on preparing it the way that it should be prepared. So again, you see Jesus using this figurative language and we can understand that well because even though I'm not much of a gardener at all, I still understand experience with these types of soils. So what is seed going to do when it falls on soil like that? So again, the soil is used for the condition of the heart. Jesus made a point that there are different soils of the heart. There's hard hearts. There's unprepared hearts. There's hearts that have cares and and things in this life that that we uh, put our focus on and love more than the kingdom of God. But he said the seed still falls on all of those heart conditions. And I used to wonder what made the difference. Like, does a person with a hard heart just need to hear the word of God more? Does it just need time to soften by being exposed to God's word? And the end of the the parable here gives us our answer for every one of us, no matter what condition our heart is in. Jesus gave the warning and the reason the hearts of men were in the condition that they were. Because when the word of God, otherwise known as the seed in this parable, when the word of God comes down and falls on the hearts of men, they hear the word. But how you accept the word, 
How receptive we are to God's word depends upon how we hear it. So how receptive we are to the seed depends upon how we hear the word of God. Jesus said, be careful how you hear then. When we go to the word of God to read it and to study it, or even to have it taught to us, we have to approach it with the intent of hearing from God. That's why it's a seed. It's either going to produce fruit and take root, or it's going to get shoved by the wayside. We'll kick it out of the heart. It won't take root because we have a hard heart, whatever it may be, because we're not taking it in with hearing. So when you go to read the Bible, the responsibility we have as Christians is to remember it's like a seed. Do I want it to produce in my life? Then I have to be careful how I hear. And again, that haunts me because when I'm putting on my makeup and listening to my Bible app, sometimes my mind will wonder thinking about my tasks for the day. I have to skip back 30 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever it is, and re-listen re to it because I'm like, nope, I got to listen. Plus, I'm terrible. I like to read things and I'm trying to listen on audio this year because last year I read it and it's not as easy for me to listen on audio. I'm really trying to train myself to have good listening skills and obviously I'm kind of failing. So, but that's the scripture I think about. And this is Jesus's command. And that's the, that's the simile. The word of God is like a seed. The next simile is the word, is, the word is like a lamp. The word of God is like a lamp. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Again, we're very familiar with lights. You ever try to walk in a dark room, especially when there's a bed around, you're going to stub some toe on that, right? The word of God illuminates our lives. It illuminates decision-making, it illuminates thinking, it illuminates the sin that we try to hide from the Lord. It illuminates how to navigate through a dark world. It helps us with our current situation, a lamp for my feet, as well as future steps, a light for my path. The word of God gives us wisdom and the Holy Spirit brings it to our remembrance. If we don't read the word, we don't know where we're going. We walk in darkness because as Psalms 119 says, it is a light for our path. A lot of people think, I don't need to read the word. I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need to read the word. I ask Jesus into my heart and I have a relationship with him. Jesus is the word, John 1, 1. Jesus is the word. We have to remember to know who God is. We have the word of God, okay? The word is like a mirror. James 1, 22 through 25, by the way, James is one of the best books in the Bible. It's, it's obviously, that's my, that's a bias of mine. I, it's my opinion, but again, James lays it down and he says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The Bible often emphasizes that hearing the word is not enough. It is acting on the word and doing it that shows we are keeping the word. Here, James equates the word to a mirror. So what does that mean? Just like when we look into the mirror, we see things we want to fix or change. Okay, I deal with mirrors every day every day. And I know what it's like to look at myself in the mirror and be like, and eh -eh, we're putting some, you know, cover up on that, put a little bit of eyeliner on this, put a little more foundation over those, you know, splotches on your face. We, we look at things that we don't like. We see things that we do. The word reveals spiritual things that need to be fixed as well. And the word reveals the one who can fix them. When those things are revealed to us, that is God working in our lives to reveal secrets and hidden things that only God can reveal. That's part of having a relationship with him. But when we walk away after the Holy Spirit reveals ourselves to us, it's like walking away after seeing pepper in your teeth and doing nothing about it. Who does that? Or worse yet, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror when you hear the word of God and you know that you need to change something and you don't. It's like, you know, you take the time to fix the pepper in your teeth because that's a physical thing, but you do nothing when it reveals the spiritual things that need to be changed. What matters more to us, the physical or the spiritual? When we only fix the physical things and use a mirror to do that, but we don't use the mirror of God's word to fix the spiritual, then we're not putting our eyes on an eternal outcome. James said the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's God's word, and perseveres, now, again, perseverance shows there's a struggle. You only have to persevere when something's hard, right? 
And being under the scalpel of the Holy Spirit is hard. It doesn't feel good in the moment. But as James said, the man perseveres and acts and doesn't forget what was revealed by the word. He's the one who will be blessed in what he does. He'll be blessed, not the one who forgets the pepper in their teeth, spiritually speaking. So I love that simile and that, um, you know, the word is like a mirror. Another simile is the word is like a sword. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God and part of the armor is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The Bible is used here as a weapon of both offense and defense. It protects and it defends. It is the only weapon used to defeat the enemy. And we see this all throughout the Bible. In fact, when Jesus was in the wilderness, he used the word when Satan tempted him. Satan used the word against Jesus, but he did it deceitfully. He didn't do it to speak truth. He used it to deceive, just like he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. So there is no Christian life. There's no Christian life without the word of God. Romans 10, 17 even says you're only here because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how do we increase our faith? With the word. How do we resist the enemy? With the word. How do we stand firm when life gets tough? With the sword of the spirit, which is the word. So just apply this to a practical situation in life. What soldier is going to go to war without a weapon? Now, these days, they don't use swords anymore in battle. But do you think that any, any soldier is going to leave his weapon to the side and just put on the armor? Um, that would be a stupid soldier. A novice soldier. I don't even know if a novice soldier would do that because everyone knows. Everyone. This is why the Bible uses the sword as also a simile. And I don't even think it's a simile. And in, in the spiritual sense, it is a sword. It is a weapon of defense and offense. So you, Christian, are in a spiritual battle. You know, I saw someone post a reel a few weeks ago, it must have been maybe a month ago now, where a man is trying to pump up the crowd. And, you know, again, I have to be careful with how I explain these things because they literally drive me up the wall when these Christian influencers want to rile people up with, you're going to do this and you're going to, you're going to win your battles because Jesus already fought them for you and you got dreams and people don't like you because they see God all over you. It's hogwash. It's nonsense. It's, it's ridiculous. But the man in this reel was saying, why are you fighting a war that Jesus already won? If Jesus won the war, there is no battle to fight. This is what he's saying. And then everybody cheers. Yay, there's no battle. I'm sorry. What? What? What happened to Ephesians 6? Why did Jesus tell us that our adversary, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy? Why, why did he say that? Jesus defeated the enemy. Yes, he did. That's true. But you are in enemy territory as long as you walk this earth because he is the God of the age. And that means you must take up the sword of the spirit because we live in a dark world. The enemy plays for keeps. He would love for you guys to buy into this whole message of you don't have to fight a battle because Jesus already won it. So you sit on your hands and do nothing till Jesus comes. Jesus defeated the enemy. And that means he has given us every tool we need to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. There's no option to stay out of the battle. And that means the sword is a must. So another simile is this, the word is like bread. And again, this is another reason why I read the Bible daily. I feel like we all know what bread is, right? You use it to make sandwiches with, make your toast. Um, but in this sense, it means nourishment. Okay. It doesn't actually mean a loaf of bread, but my question to you is, do you go without a meal? Do you go a day without eating? Do you only eat on Sunday mornings when, you know, you have breakfast before church? Equate the physical again to the spiritual. Jesus said, man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's in Matthew 4, 4, and it's also in Deuteronomy. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the body is more than just physical things. It's more than food. And just like your body needs food each day to live and thrive and have energy, your soul needs nourishment too. Yet so many Christians neglect the food of the soul, which is the word of God. And remember, remember the stat. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. This is not just an observation. This is an actual statistic that 65% of Americans claim to be Christian, yet only 6% have a biblical worldview. That says it all. What does that say about the value that Christians, who people who claim to know God, 
place on reading and studying the Bible. It says we don't place much value on it, but I bet you every one of those people eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day and a few snacks in between. If we, if we place value on the word, we would see it as a life and death situation. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying man does not live on bread alone. That's life and death. Do we see the word of God that way? Are we looking at it in that through that perspective? Because some people only hear the word on Sunday mornings for 30 to 45 minutes. How would you survive with only one meal a week? You, you can't. You can't. I think it's easier when we see the simile. I think it's, it's easier when we understand the comparison of those two like things, the word of God to bread, because it helps bring the depth to the message in God's word and say, showing the importance, like really spotlighting the importance of the word of God in the life of a believer. And I'm not trying to be an ELA teacher by telling you all the similes and figurative language. I'm trying to draw out the emphasis the Bible places on what it is to the life of the Christian. And finally, the last simile we're going to go over today is the word is like a foundation. When Jesus told the parable of the wise man who built his house on the rock and the foolish man who built his house on sand, he was talking about those who only hear the word compared to those who hear and apply it. So it's not that people don't have access to the word. It's not that people don't read the word. It's that they don't do what it says. A wise woman hears the word and lives by it. A foolish woman hears and does not do. But they both have access to the word. We have a lot of people who hear the word, but they don't understand it. They use it out of context. They throw it around. They cherry pick it. We know these things, right? But do they live by it? Or is it just a motto that they want to put up in the house and say, this scripture really sounds great. I'll claim that. We have the Bible at our disposal in, in America. We do. We are more blessed with access to it than many. But is hearing it enough? Not according to this parable. We must hear and do. Otherwise, we're like a man who builds a house without a foundation. And what happens to the house? It crumbles. Jesus doesn't try and sugarcoat anything here. He said, both men experienced rain, storms, and the beating of their homes with the storms of life. We are all going to go through hard things, but the one whose house was built on the solid foundation, the application of the word, was the one who took the storms and still survived. So what does this show us about the Bible? It shows us the purpose of the word of God. There is a reason we are to know it. In the Old Testament, before the Israelites took over the promised land, God continually told them not to forget his words, but to tie them as symbols on their hands and bind them on their foreheads. Why do that? So they wouldn't forget the word, because when they forget the word, they forget their God. But what does it start with? It starts with knowing that your life depends on it like bread, responding to it when it reveals your inner secrets like a mirror, building your life on it as you apply it like a foundation, remembering it during temptations and spiritual battles like a sword, and trusting it will guide you like a lamp. And every time you sit to read and study it, you know it's being planted like a seed, so you're careful how you hear it. I want to wrap this up today by encouraging you to be careful who you hear the word from. Remember, there are false teachers out there who will interpret the word for you, and some know that they're falsely interpreting it, and some are deceived themselves, so they don't even know that they're misinterpreting it. Either way, it's still up to you to know the word and to be careful who you listen to. So think of it this way. Those who teach the word of God are privileged to be able to pour it into your life. They should tremble knowing that they take God's inspired word and share it with others. And that's a humbling task and one that should not be taken lightly. And if you listen to this podcast first, thank you for listening. But trust me when I tell you that I care more about what God thinks of each episode than you do. And no one pays me for this. I do it because I love teaching others about God and his word. And even my brother asked me the other day, how much do you get paid for doing your podcast? And I, I actually started laughing because, you know, I have a day job because <laughs> this one ain't going to pay the bills. But that makes it easier. It makes it easier not to care. I'm not going to be bought by anyone. God is my boss. I'll stand before him one day and give an account for how I represented him. And I long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the kingdom. I'm not going to deceive or twist his words to win a few more downloads. I mean, that is not worth it. So if I make a mistake, either Albert's going to tell me because he always has to listen to these to edit them, or I'm going to be corrected by the Holy Spirit in my studies and I'll do my best to make it right with my listeners. That's my, that's my promise 
hear as I share. Because again, God is the boss. If you have a hard time reading the word and loving it, I get it. I understand because it's not always easy for me or anyone else who's developing a discipline. But if it is routine and a task and you don't want it to be, I've been there as well. And I just don't stop. And I tell God that it's it feels like a routine, but I'm not going to stop. So be honest with God and tell him. Ask him for a fresh passion and a love for the word, but continue to read it as you do. And tell others what you read. Share your knowledge, and that will help ignite that flame. But if it is a routine, I know some you know aren't going to like this, but it's true. It should be. It should be just as routine as eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It should be as routine as brushing your teeth and checking your makeup in the mirror. It should be that routine. God takes care of the rest of it. Your responsibility is to, one, be careful how you hear, two, be diligent to nourish your soul, three, don't be just a hearer, only but a doer, four, carry your sword, and that means you got to read it, and five, respond when the word corrects you. I hope this episode encouraged you today. Don't go a day without reading the Bible. If you are a Christian and you want to know God, pick it up. Don't claim to know him and not even read his word. There's no way that you can know him unless you read it. For questions about this and anything else I share, email me at hello at and I'll catch you on the next one. 